swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. My name is Graham Brown. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. And today I've got something special for you today, listeners. Are you ready to leap over fiery logs and through red hot flames? Because today's episode of Endurance FM is all about satisfying your hunger for adventure, quenching that thirst for competition, and preparing for the most fun you've ever had in mud. And we're going to talk about making millions out of mud, how the sport of obstacle course racing grows up. And to do that, we're joined by the founder of Mud Run Guide, the largest independent website in the world for obstacle racing news, events, and tips. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sports business. All the way from Phoenix, Arizona. Here's Brett Stewart. Welcome to the show. Wow, Graham, that was that was pretty impressive. I, I just hope that I can live up to that ent- that intro. You will do. I mean, if your background <laughs> speaks anything like you can do, you will live up to that. Oh. So, Brett, thanks so much for joining us on the show. It's obviously the first time we've talked about obstacle racing. Tell us a little bit about well, what it's about. I mean, may, people may be familiar with the Spartan Race, Tough mm-hmm. Mudder, OCR World Championships. What is a mud run, effectively? Well, um, yeah, it's, really, it starts off with mud and running. So, you know, that sport has has matured and grown. So what was, you know, a couple of mud pits and kind of a trail run and maybe jumping over a wall or crawling through a tube has kind of matured from the mud run to obstacle course racing, which is uh, known by the acronym OCR now. And that's um, – you know, a little more advanced. The obstacles are bigger. The obstacles are more exciting and more difficult and uh, more expensive. Mm. You know, it used to be a, a wall and a cargo net, and now it's you know rigging and hanging from stuff. But for anyone who's uh, seen American Ninja Warrior, it's a little, or maybe not American Ninja Warrior, but Ninja Warrior or some Suzuki, whatever the heck is Suzuki, whatever it's called uh, in Japan. But um, anyone who's seen that, um, you know, really has a, a good idea of what you know, having big obstacles or liking, you know, you're getting from point A to point B and you've got all these amazing obstacles between you and the finish line. And the growth of that, like the Spartan race and Tough Mudder um, have gone worldwide. And usually Tough Mudder is one of those, uh, the, the, the name sticks out and people remember and they usually say, oh, don't you get shocked or don't you have to jump in ice water? And mm-hmm. that's a little tiny piece of the sport. The sport is is really much more about the athletic endeavor from you know, getting over obstacles and conquering fears. Um, it's not so much about, you know, getting hurt or getting shocked or getting frozen. Right. Well, we'll talk about the athletic endeavor in a minute. But first, let me ask you, what is your personal favorite obstacle? Favorite obstacle? I, you know, I like rigs. I like um, uh, a rig is anything with, uh, you know, usually 10, 12 feet in the air. And it's got, um, you know, different things hanging off of it, whether it's balls or skulls or tires or ropes or whatever. And you've got to swing from one side to the other without touching the ground. Um, I love stuff like that. There's a particular company out there from Canada called Platinum Rig, and they build these rigs that are used all over the world now in these races. And um, the flavor of them is unbelievable because they can change it all the time. There's you know, there's pipes and ropes and chains and all these different things. Um, the creativity, that's the other thing. Mm. The thing that I love about obstacle course racing is the creativity of uh, the race directors and the race uh, course designers and these – ridiculous obstacles you know you mentioned the ocr world championships it's an uh, you know a, a event that i'm really happy to be uh, a part of we bring in all these different uh, obstacles from different uh, race companies all over the world you know from sweden or from or from spain or from you know all over the u.s and canada so really get these interesting uh challenges and every year is different we've got stuff like floating walls and tubes and this and that it's it's really it's a blast, man. It's, it's so much fun. Right. Well, you talk about the creativity side. Has there ever been an obstacle that you've, I mean, maybe as a, an athlete, you've looked, stared down and you thought, well, actually, that's just too creative. That's too, <laughs> that's too near the, I mean, without sort of going into like the live animals, which you talked about. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah, would be, yeah. I mean, has there ever been an obstacle you thought, wow, that's just really, that's pushing the envelope a little bit of what's safe here? Well, the, one of the great things, I actually do get to design the courses um, for not only for some of my own races, but for the uh, U.S. championships and some of the obstacles for the world championships. And there is a long process of going back and forth on the things that make sense. It's not 
it's realistically, it's not about just building an obstacle that you're going to scare somebody or make somebody fail because that's easy to do. You make it really hard. You make it really high. You make it really far. Those things, that's easy. It's very easy to break an athlete. The hard thing to do is to have a string of obstacles that will push an athlete right up to that edge yet still allow them to complete it. And mm. that's a very difficult thing. And um, so when you say, are there some that go way over <laughs> We do that all the time. Usually, we'll create something that's so stupid, and then we'll back it off until it makes sense. <laughs> right. Okay. Good. That's good to know. So there is a process here to you go through with checks and balances, right? So. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's a, if, if I was left to my own devices, it would probably, uh, there, there would be some scary stuff out there. But no, we, we definitely go back and forth. There's been obstacles. Um, I actually tore my rotator cuff on an obstacle that I made, and it was one of those things where I thought that it would be a really good idea. I'm not going to talk about what it was because it was stupid, um, but I thought it was going to be a good idea. And um, we finished it at midnight at about 12.01. I climbed over it mm. and realized that when it, my fleet slipped out from underneath me and I landed on my shoulder, um, that it was a very bad idea. We, <laughs> we, scra we scrapped it, pulled it off the course, and we didn't use it. But um, those are the type of dumb mistakes that you make. Um, right. Luckily, I was the only one hurt. And uh, you know, it was really more a pride thing than anything else. Well, it's good that you actually, the course designer is actually testing his own obstacles. I think that's Oh, a good we thing. always do. Oh, right. yeah. That's, that's a big part of it. Um, right. I, I love being an athlete, and I'm not a, an, I'm, the course is, is covered with really elite athletes. There's people that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll build something and we'll think that it's tough, and these athletes will destroy it. Mm. Just absolutely go through it in 50, you know, it takes us a month to plan it out and build it, and they're over it in, in, you know, 0.5 seconds. Mm. But um, if we find the right balance, it's an obstacle that will challenge, you know, the beginners as well as be a at least a small impediment for some of the elite right. athletes. Okay, good. good. All right, well, let's talk about the athlete side of things because let's put this into context for the listeners. Brett, you are an Ironman finisher, an mm -hmm. ultramarathon, a fitness model, and an author, as well as a running and triathlon coach. So you've got a pretty extensive resume, as well as being an entrepreneur, and we talk about your business with Mud Run Guide and growing that, as well as your publications and your mm -hmm. other projects as well in a minute. But that's quite an impressive resume when it comes to physical <laughs> that's endeavor, a, right? That's a, that's a mouthful, yeah. Right, right. right. And the last guy on earth you'd ever think would ever do any of these things. Exactly, because what I want to do now is, you know where we're going, I want to take the clock back, but there's a moment that we talked about off air, which is <laughs> October 2001. And yep. you are not an Ironman finisher, ultramarathon, uh, fitness model author <laughs> at that stage, right? Take us back. So take us back, oh. way back to October 2001. What's going on? Oh, I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs. I mean, I, you know, I, I wasn't that fat. I, you know, I, I, I guess I'm a little more self-effacing than, uh, than, than I, uh, I like to put out there. But realistically, I was, you know, I was always overweight. I was chubby. I was never, never felt good about, you know, I was never a fit kid. I was, you know, I used to get chuckled at during the, um, the president over here in the States. We, um, in, in uh, elementary school, you have the presidential fitness challenge or whatever they call it. And you've got to do so many sit-ups and so many pull-ups. And, you know, I was, I was a, you know, I was a little bit of a roly poly chubby kid. I didn't do anything particularly well. I liked sports, but I wasn't the all-star. I was the, I was kind of the guy that was last picked, you know, I was, yeah. I was on my baseball team because my dad was the coach, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that sort of kid. Uh, you know, my brother was the all-star, but I was, uh, yeah, I was the also ran. But, um, you know, I was never fit. I was never into it. And, you know, as I, as I got older, you know, I, I, I started smoking cigarettes and eating for crap. And, you know, I, I, I actually got fat. I wouldn't say I was obese, but I, you know, I'm a five foot eight and change guy and I was probably 210 pounds or so. So, right. you know, it was definitely, you know, really outside of healthy, um, whether I was obese or not, who knows, but I was straddling that line pretty close. And, um, you know, the craziest part is even at this this low point, um, I found the the love of my life. I met my wife, and um, we got married. And one of the things when we came back from uh, from our wedding, we got the uh, the proofs back of our mm -hmm. photos, and she was beautiful, and I was so fat in those photos. <laughs> oh, no. I was, and you know, I, I don't want to sound vain, but I looked at the photos, and it was just it was disproportionate. I was it was the heaviest I'd ever been. I yeah. looked 
it really, I felt like I, I, I was poured into that suit. I was so, you know, my, my cheeks were, were bigger than I'd ever seen. And I was just disgusted with myself. You know, there were, uh, there were plenty of times I failed. Like even, even during our, 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 our wedding, I drew some friends over and we were climbing a, uh, a rock wall. It was out in Las Vegas. And I was, you know, I said, oh, come on, we're going to do this. And I dragged all my friends over to this rock wall and I couldn't get past the first couple of feet without falling off because wow. I wasn't strong and I was, you know, I was overweight. So that was humbling. But then when I saw those photos, that was, uh, you know, that was it. You know, I already knew the way that I looked. But when you see it in a photo and it's a photo that you're going to have for the rest of your life. Yeah, right. That that really hit home, and you know, if you fast forward, really, you know, jump jump to, uh, 15 years in the future when I was doing um, some modeling for some of my books, I realized, you know, I knew that ahead of time going into, hey, these photos are going to be around for uh, for a heck of a long time, maybe as long as my wedding photos. Mm. So, you know, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to you know get into shape, I'm going to look good, and you know, that's how it started. Really, I I didn't have any interest in being a runner or a triathlete or Ironman or obstacle course racer. Well, I guess it didn't exist back then, but um, I wanted to be fit and I wanted to be thin. You know, I just I couldn't stand being fat, and I jumped into it head over heels. But I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. Uh, so it was a it was a it was a weird journey to go from fat to fit. And there were, there were a lot of pit stops along the way. Yeah, right. And there's, there's a lot of transformation there as well. It's not just your body image. It's, it's so much more than that that we'll talk about, which is, you know, your everything about your attitude towards life and attitude towards business and being an entrepreneur as well. So we'll talk about that journey as we sort of go along that path. But there's this interesting story that you also tell about this race, Brian's Beachside Boogie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about that because that, I mean, it sounds like an amazing race kind of like back in the old school days when people were doing the triathlons in speedos and stuff. And oh, this, yeah. is, this is a duathlon, right? So what, yes. what's this event about? And tell us about your experience there. Oh, it's back in, uh, I want to say like 2002 or three. Uh, I should know the exact date. We'll say, we'll say 2003. A buddy of mine, a kid that I kid that used to hang out, I used to own a coffee shop and a kid that used to hang out in my coffee shop and became good friends said, oh, um, he's younger than I am, way fitter than I am. And he goes, oh, you, you totally want to come out and do this, um, do this race with me. And I said, oh, okay, what can it be? And he said, oh, well, it's a duathlon. It's a little short run and you ride your mountain bike around in a circle and then it's a little short run. I said, oh, well, I, I guess, I guess I can do that. I'd never run a mile before in my life. I'd never wow. been in a race or anything. And, uh, he talked to me, I borrowed my dad's mountain bike cause I didn't have one. And he talked me into coming out to this race and it was it was a real race. There was actually other people there. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's probably 300, 400 people at the start line and, um, the gun goes off and we go running and man, three quarters of a mile in, I was, I was miserable. I was cursed. <laughs> he, he actually ran off. I finally said, listen, dude, I'm going to take, I'm going to take my jacket off. Cause it was a chilly race. I, I was overheated and miserable. I was so pissed off at him. I, if there was anything for me to, to throw at him, I would have, I, I, I could not stand it. And then I, you know, I managed to finish the run somehow. And then uh, my first, this was my first 5K, I guess. So I finished the run, and then I got on the bike, and the damn chain fell off every time I hit a bump. It was the worst experience ever. Mm. And then um, I, almost, I, I was going to quit. I was too stupid. I guess I was too stupid not to quit or too stubborn not to quit. Mm. But um, I was, when I parked the bike, I, I, I turned and looked at my, my wife, and I'm like, ah, this sucks. And parked the bike, and I, ran, I went out for the last loop of the run. And that whole time sucked as well, <laughs> except except for the last hundred yards. I came around the corner and I saw the finish line, and man, it was it was it was golden. I, I to, honestly, I, I I still get goosebumps to the, to this mm. this day. It was so amazing to go from the lows of the lows to just hating this race to I crossed the finish line and I I could not wait. I, I signed up for the next year right then. Um, I signed up for you know my first 5K you know the next day at work. Um, I went head over heels into racing. I I loved crossing the finish line so much that I knew it was something I was going to do a thousand more times if I could. Wow, wow. great feeling. Great. How did that transformation happen then? Because I'm, you know, there's this point where you talk about in your your earlier life where you were the kid that gets picked last in sports right and you talk yeah. about that president's race and stuff like that you know which you must mm -hmm. have just hated you know every day counting Absolutely. down the days when that day would happen right and now um, you're this guy who finished this duathlon and you love it so what changed in your mind at that point what made you somebody from who 
probably I know you like sports, but you probably dreaded a lot of you know being involved in competitive sports to somebody now who's absolutely loving it. Well, you know, when I when I crossed the finish line, it became real. It became possible, and it, it, you know it, that's the thing. Anybody, anybody can get across the. If I finish that damn race, right. anybody can get across the finish line. And once it became real, and once it became possible, I, I, I wanted to push it and see how far it could go. Mm. You know, uh, I didn't jump from there into doing an Ironman. It was, you know, it was uh, seven years later that I did an Ironman. But it t- you know, it took a while, and the growth was um, <laughs> was hard <laughs> at some points. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, 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 the great part was. I could screw up and I had no idea what I was doing and it was, it was fun. I liked, you know, I love, I'm, I'm that kid that, that loves to, kid, 46 years old, but I, I was always that kid who yeah. would love to take his bike apart and I would love to break something so I can figure out how to fix it. And, uh, you know, I, I was the same, my body was the same way. I've always tried to, I don't want to say try to break it, but I've always, you know, been willing to throw myself into something and give it a shot. Because, you know, I'm not going to win. I know that. I, I, I'm never going to win. The best I've ever done is I coming in third place in a little tiny race. And that was, uh, you know, that was just, just a fluke. I'm never going to win. <laughs> but the good part is I, I don't let that stop me. I, 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 I still want to win. Mm. But it's not about beating other people. It's about beating what I thought was possible before. And I know that sounds like a, like a cliche. But it's true. You know, I, you just keep you keep pushing, you keep nibbling around the corners, and eventually, you know, you've got something to be really proud of. Yeah, I love this idea that you know you talk about beating yourself and you know beating what you think what's possible. Because in, in a way, again, I mentioned this 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 scene where you're the kid who gets picked last in sport. <laughs> you sort of been, I guess, at a young age, and that, you know, when we're kids, we're we're heavily influenced by these events and you know i've mm-hmm. had it you've had it and sure you grow up believing that that's what's possible you know what's possible is that you are the last kid who gets picked and therefore you know it's not possible for you to be uh you know to do really well in this sport or to enjoy it it's just like you know you're just making up the numbers here so right. that was kind of how you were forged at an early age but then you've going through this transformation and there's also this other interesting track that i want to explore is where you now start writing books you know for somebody who was a, an overweight smoker you start getting into writing fitness books so I'm, yeah you kind of this whole idea of picking yourself and i love it because it's like you know right i'm going to stand up i'm going to do this and i'm now an authority on this right because i can do yep. it so tell us about how that happened well you know even going back to school uh here's the thing life is is designed well maybe not designed is the best word but life is going to make you quit i mean let's be honest the the, you know you're you're doing something and what's the end result you're not going to be here anymore so i mean realistically you know life is all about failing because at some point we all fail in life we're dead it's done you know so if you've got this you know without getting metaphysical about it if you've got this period of time here you know don't let it there's there's nothing that's going to stop you you're the only person that's going to stop you you know yes there's things you can do and things you can't do but you you find a way you know you you know you work your way around i like i said i'm never going to win a race but i'm going to go out there and i'm going to kick ass and i'm going to do better than i did last time and i'm going to enjoy myself and i look at business the same way i mean i've i've failed I failed so many times with businesses. I mean, if I, you know, you and I talked about the the list that you shared most of the list, but there's, you know, there's 15 other businesses. Every dot com um, that I've ever worked for has gone under. You know, I've, <laughs> you know, I've never had that IPO million dollar thing, but I've, I've been, you know, I've been to that race a, a dozen times. Mm. You know, and it's, but it's awesome. I, you know. I don't look at failure. I maybe maybe I'm weird. Maybe I, I'm a little bit twisted, but I don't look at failure as a bad thing. You know, I look at failure as whoop, well, you know, that I tried really hard mm. and that thing was good or bad or ugly, but I learned something. And uh, you know, just a, a tiny little quick tangent. I, I mentioned, you know, I, and I bring this up about my brother every once in a while when I'm talking about this subject. He was the all star. He was the it, it, it was still alive. Great guy. Uh, mm. But my brother always had success. Um, I was the other end of, of the continuum. I wasn't the all-star. I wasn't the starting pitcher. I wasn't, um, you know, a great ball player. You know, I wasn't getting courted by Mensa or Dean's List or anything. But he had that success his entire life. He got to a point in his life where 
everything and it really wasn't the biggest of, of deals but you know he made uh, he made a mistake and he had to try to figure out how to deal with it and mm. the weird part was you know I, my I love my brother to death he's a, you know a smarter better guy than, than than I am in in all senses of the word but he was lost because he had never had that failure where I was you know I was kind of a, a jerk to him I just you know I pretty much on a daily basis, just tell them to suck it up, Buttercup, because you know I had failed so many times that I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to be to be broke and you know own a guitar. <laughs> you know right. that's that was all I had. I, I had you know a guitar and the clothes on my back. So I've been there. Um, failure is not it's not a horrible thing. It's not it, it, the fear of failure is way worse than the failure. It's like the fear of a doctor's visit is way worse than okay. getting one stupid shot. But the thing is, you know, if you, if you don't go to the doctor, you're, you know, you might be screwed. If you don't take a, a chance and if you're so afraid of failure that you're not going to try, that you're not going to ask that, that pretty girl for a day, I, I, I wouldn't have changed my life if I didn't meet mm. my wife, if I didn't have the guts to, to ask her out. I mean, these are the things that you have to do. And I'm not, and understand, I haven't always been this intrepid explorer. Literally, I was a person before that didn't have the guts, that didn't have the really? drive. Yeah, I, I, you know, I was. Um, I don't really know, you know, I can't really tell you where the change was, but a couple little, well, I, I can't. I, there's, um, have you ever heard of uh, the band Twisted Sister? Yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, so uh, D, I, D. Snyder, the lead singer, um, I used to work with him, and he used to have a radio show here here in, uh, in the states. And um, it was funny; uh, just having a little tiny bit of confidence did me well. And you know, we, we were working on different things and getting a little bit more exposure, and I got a little bit, you know, a little bit more confidence. And it was funny how just a tiny little bit of confidence, a tiny little bit of elevation of status for me kicked me into a whole different ball game where I. I started to realize things were possible, and then from there, you, you know, uh, you said you make your, you, you know, you take your chances, you pick your spots, and everything is legitimately possible. Mm. That's really interesting. So you, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you were the kid that liked to take things apart and <laughs> maybe yeah. put them back together again, right? Just and you, you, this well, whole... there's always some part, parts left over, of course. <laughs> exactly. So you 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 like learning how things work and you like you know experimenting and pulling things apart you, you sort of exist in that world or you're very comfortable with failure even mm -hmm. at a young age but maybe you know at school school doesn't sort of you know reward people for that kind of behavior unfortunately but then you got out into the real world so to speak and where you know you had to choose your own path and you started experimenting and then you know maybe it was just a case of gradually building momentum, slow momentum, but you had a few successes and things started building, but you realized actually that, you know, th this is all about, I've got to make the decisions here. Nobody's going to look after me. And that's what, that's the comfort with failure, isn't it? Nobody's going to bail you out. Nope. Nobody's going to come and rescue you. You know, if you screw up, you screwed up, you know, you've got to yep. pick it up and suck it up. Right. Yep. So now yeah, that's, that's way harder, obviously with, you know, with, with a wife and kid than it is, you right. know, when I, when I started my first business, you know, when I was 17, 18 years old. But yeah, it's, it gets a lot more difficult as you get older, but uh, it's still, it's, sometimes it's even more rewarding. Mm -hmm. Was that, I mean, when you came to this decision to write a book, mm -hmm. and you started and you've published now 15 health and fitness books, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, it's not like, Right, I'm going to see if I am any good at writing a book. You know, you've made a, a career out of writing books, and that's also helped you launch Mud Run Guide as well. We'll talk about that in a minute. Sure. So, how did you get into writing? And you know, was it something that you always wanted to do, or was it just kind of like, yeah, I want to sort of pull this apart and see what happens? Type. So. You know, it's, it's probably a little bit more of the latter. Um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a friend, a, g a guy that I've I, to this day I've never met face to face, but a Twitter friend of mine um, had written a book: uh, seven uh, seven weeks to a hundred push-ups was the book. Uh, it's the guy Steve Spears, and I popped him a message. I said, "Whoa, dude, that's kind of cool." Um, Maybe I, I, and the funny, funny part was this next phrase happened to come out of my fingers and I didn't really have a, a, a cognitive thought behind it. But I said, boy, I, I'd always, would always like to make, write a, publish a book. You know, I, I forget what I even, we even sent to him, mm. but he said, oh, well, here's my, here's my, my, uh, editors, my acquisition editors, uh, email address, go at it, have fun. 
And um, I ended up, he, he didn't feel like writing any more books. I ended up taking over the franchise. And that's where I went from having never, you know, written anything longer than a book report to, uh, you know, to suddenly I, you know, I, I've got 15 different books published all over the world and, you know, dozens of different languages and all this other goofy stuff. And, and that was really a springboard, you know, one thing after the other, after the other, where, you know, I, I'm in this, I'm living a great life and in a great position in this world of obstacle course racing that, you know, as of 2010, I would have never, ever, I was working in technology, man. I, you know, I was a, I was a manager for, uh, you know, for, um, an engineering group. I never would have thought that I would be this far into fitness, but it's just so happened that right at the same time I was, I was training for, for Ironman. So I was really into fitness, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing and it was really fun to, um, you know, to pull things apart and see how training programs work and to see how my body reacted to stuff and to see how the people, you know, that I was uh, tra- uh, training, to see how they would react to stuff. And it was, there was a lot of trial and error and there was, you know, definitely being my own guinea pig was the best way for me to learn. And one of the things that um, th- that's a constant in all of my books is, you know, while yeah, yeah, I'm a coach and a trainer and all that other sort of sort of stuff. I'm not a scientist. You know, there's there's so many things that are are, are left to are are, are, are there. <laughs> you know, I can only I can only train for what I know, and I can only teach for what I've learned. And it's and that's why I can write a book that relates to everybody because I'm not going to go over your head with some long scientific explanation because I don't know, you know, that's the great part is it's still a journey. It's still a journey where I'm figuring out, you know, what I can get away with at 46. I'm learning what, what my body will do now, you know? So it's, it, it's fun. It's challenging. It's interesting. And the feedback that I've gotten from people all over the world is, is pretty, that's pretty bitching. I love when I get, an email that I can't translate that it's in a language I've never seen before, or I get, uh, you know, uh, get goofy Facebook messages from people asking me just about anything. Mm. Uh, I love the fact that my book has touched somebody and then it has helped them. Well, let's that's talk cool. about that. Cause I think that's quite of an important part of measuring success, isn't it? Is that beyond the numbers, how much, you know, how, how will people miss you when you're gone, right? You know, it's that sort of emotional part, isn't it? If you stop writing books, you stop getting these messages. What kind of messages do people send you, you know, or, you know, do people tell you face-to-face in public when they read your book? Um, you know, usually um, it's, it's funny. I, I've met a handful of people face-to-face that know me from my books, and that's, that's weird, man. I'm not a rock star, so it's right. not like, oh, my God. But it's really cool to have somebody, you know, I, I actually uh, – um, uh, met uh, a dude here locally that um, bought my book y- years ago, and he said, "I've been, you know, always trying to trying to connect with you." And he popped me a message and said, "Hey, I'm going to be at a coffee shop. If you don't mind, I'd love to just meet you and shake your hand and, and have you sign my book." He said that the difference that it's made for for me um, has been huge, and that was great. I loved, you know, he, he bought me coffee too, which is even better. <laughs> we, got, we got to stop and talk about it a little bit. But um, I I have a handful of. Um, uh, of people, it's, it's funny. I, um, the book must have done really well, or a couple of my books must have done really well in uh, in India. And I'll get um, you know messages, uh, you know, from uh, from India from time to time um, that are are fun and interesting. Uh, you know, it, it's all over the map. And I've had people ask me, you know, what they should eat. To people telling me, you know, hey, I. I masturbate five times a week. Is that a bad thing for fitness? <laughs> like, like just weird. so. I mean, I put myself out there and right. I and get some really interesting things back. Right. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's 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 really it's pretty wild, you know. Uh, and to, to your point, you mentioned you know what if I stop writing books? Well, interestingly enough, I I haven't written a book in three years now. Um, so my prolific period of writing books was really, really just a four year period. Um, and that's, that's what fueled my, uh, my, uh, transition into mud run guide and the world of obstacle course racing. And, you know, it's just, it's so neat to be in a world where I know all the players. I, I love it. I, you know, I, I can connect with any of the athletes or any of the, any of the races or, uh, any of the personalities. Um, and I, I thoroughly enjoy that because there's so many really neat people in this sport that I could, you know, uh, I, I can pick up and talk to at any, at any moment. Amazing. Well, and let's then, talk about mud run guide. Cause that's really the, the main thing that your, you know, your obsession, your project, your, <laughs> your business these days. I mean, 
I guess that came from your, you were starting out writing books about the ultimate obstacle course race guide and so on. That sort of transitioned you into the mud run thing. Yeah. Before we sort of get to that, tell us what is Mud Run Guide, the the website? And what sort of, have you got any numbers in terms of the size of the website, the visitors and so on? So people can kind of picture what it's about. Oh, sure. We do um, upwards of around 10 million page views a year. So it's, um, you know, somewhere in the ballpark, 800,000 or so uh, page views every month. Um, I think it's about 3 million unique uh, visitors. So, you know, uh, people come back, you know, on average, people come back about three, three and a half times um, to to the site. But realistically, the, you know, we've got a, a pretty fervent following of, of folks that are there uh, you know, on a daily basis. We produce um, we actually produced a, a, one of our own little um, web TV shows, which was this OCR Warrior, and we do um, a couple of podcasts, and we've got a tremendous crew. You know, I've got uh, my – she's like my little sister, this uh, – this uh, famous blogger, uh, Margaret Schlachter, who was um, one of, she created dirt in your skirt, uh, dot com, and she was one of the first female uh, pro athletes in, in the sport of obstacle course racing. And she's one of our uh, she's our, our editor in chief. Uh, she creates a lot of creates and cultivates a lot of the content. Um, but we've got a whole team of writers, uh, people from all over the all over the world that that send uh, different stories and reviews in. We, so we do a lot of really neat stuff. But the the bread and butter the, um, of what Mud Run Guide is is it's actually it's a place to go and find every race or at least every race in the U.S. We try to make it as worldwide as possible. It's a little more difficult uh, encompassing the entire globe. But, um, you know, so we've got every race uh, in the, uh, you know, in the U.S., primarily North America, um, where you can go uh, see where the race is, learn information about the race. But it's all in one place. So when you're looking at um, a, a Tough Mudder page on Mud Run Guide, Spartan Race is right there. Warrior Dash is right there. So you can compare, contrast, and you can find the races that are closest to you. And then one of the other features that we provide is we provide um, discounts on all these races as well because it does get quite expensive. Yeah. But um, – but that's really what the site is for. It's a, you know, it's a, um, way back when my, my partner and I founded it, um, I was just finishing up Ultimate Obstacle Race Training, and uh, Chris, my partner, was helping me out with, uh, with a, a different website for one of my other books. And I called him up and I said, listen, we absolutely have to do this. And then I talked for the next 20 minutes. And as I was done, he's a, he's a quiet guy, very intelligent guy. As I finished my, 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 my diatribe, he said, Brett, go home and go to mudrunguide.com and look what I've done. And it just so happened that he had the same thought that I did at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, he needed um, some motivation to do it. I had the contacts and I had um, the, I guess, the name at that point. So I had, I had a piece. He had a piece. And um, from, from then on in, we went from zero people to you know, tens of millions of people. Yeah. Where did you start out with that? Was that like a side project? I mean, how did it fit into your already busy schedule? Was it sort of you know, two <laughs> hours in the evening or what did that work? Yeah. Well, my schedule really wasn't bu- that, that busy to begin with. At that point, um, you know, I was working in technology. Um, my background, I, um, I'm a graphic designer. And then I transitioned from there into um, uh, user interface design and was managing. So uh, in my previous life, I was lucky enough to be at, uh, at ESPN. Um, and worked, worked there in the sports network, uh, side of it for a while in technology. And that's where I really cut my teeth and we founded the ESPN triathlon club and all this other good stuff. And I started putting on events, but they were all, these were all hobbies. And then when I came out to uh, Arizona, it was really to train year round and, uh, you know, work for this tech company. So even the books were never my full-time job. I was still working in technology and uh, as that career started to fizzle out, uh, well, I guess the career fizzled out because I was way more interested in the books and the right. racing training and everything else. I think that was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, I liked racing more than I liked going to work. So, that, <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of where that whole thing grew. And, but but Mud Run Guide was never, it was never meant to be a business. I mean, we, we ran it as a business from day one. But um, we didn't go into it with any plans. We never had any any profit idea. It wasn't like we said, "All right, here's our business plan. We're going right. to make a million dollars by doing this," and that never was the case. We made a lot of, and my, I guess it was my partner. We made a lot of smart decisions at, um, in in the beginning, and um, 
you know, little did we know that this was a whole cottage market. And we uh, were lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time with the right technology and the right partners to really kind of corner the market and really, uh, really grab all of that traffic that was coming into this new sport. Mm -hmm. And that's where it went from something we were just goofing off with to something where, you know, gosh, you know, it's a, this is a real job. You know, my wife quit her, quit her job as a paralegal. You know, I, I, I got out of technology. I even stopped writing books just to focus on, on Mud Run Guide. And that's, uh, and that, that's where it's been. You know, it's, it's mm. grown since February 2012 to now. So we're in our fifth year. And it, uh, it, it, it's wild because, because the sport is so fertile right now, you know, it, it's growing off in all these different directions. You know, whether it's, you know, the, luckily being able to be involved with the world championships or the US OCR championships and watching all these different um, pieces just grow. I, I'm, at, I'm at ground zero for it, and I love it, and I love mm. being involved with it. But I'll tell you right now, Graham, I have no idea where this is going to take me in the next month or two months or years from now. No clue, and I love that. Right, right. I was going to say, I mean, you, you're very comfortable in that scenario, right? Because from your, from a very early age, you've been in that scenario many, many times, right? You've put yourself <laughs> out there. So yeah. where was the time, when was the time, sorry, where you actually went on full time into this? And then your wife joined later on, didn't she? Or? Yeah, um, so she's been doing it for two years. So for me, I've been full time with Mud Run Guide for a little over um, over three years. Right. So that's the crazy part is, you know, is honestly, you know, we both had professional careers. It wasn't like we were both, you know, washing dishes or flipping burgers. Mm -hmm. So to go from a technology background, um, you know, with a relatively, yeah, with a, a, a steady good income, you know, for the two of us to be able to do, uh, to do this full time, it's a, it's a challenge, you know, it's, it's in some ways it was a step up in some ways it's, um, it's a roller coaster ride. I, personally like the roller coaster ride <laughs> my wife will would be giving the exact exact opposite answer you know she she hates it but um i think she sees the way the way that it motivates me um and she'll she she just comes along for the ride i guess right, i don't right. know she's got to organize me somehow exactly well it's important to have that balance if you were both very keen on the roller coaster ride that would be a pretty crazy relationship right i think yeah it, you always find usually in business there's a, a balance where one person's like the rock and the other person's you know very airy and out there right totally totally yeah you, so, you can tell which one i am yeah exactly no no explanation needed was there <laughs> was there a time when you were after you went full-time and maybe when your wife went full-time as well when you were working on mud run guide and you just had this moment, you thought, hey, this is, I'm getting paid for doing this, right? And, <laughs> you know, this is paying the bills, I'm doing this full time. And, you know, maybe you're going out to races and whatever you're doing as well. Was there a moment where you actually sort of stepped back and thought, wow, this is actually happening? Is this for real? Every morning. I, again, there's, there's no, no bullshit. I, I kid you not. <laughs> Every single morning, I'm, you know, I'll be, you know, I'll go out for a run or I'll go, you know, I'll, I'll grab the pedal board and go out to the lake and paddle around a little bit. I'm not saying that I don't work, uh, but I, I do love the flexibility that I have. And there isn't a day where I don't go, okay, well, this has been an awesome ride. If, if today's the day where it ends, um, you know, what's the next thing going to be? I don't think that the end is coming anywhere soon. It's, you know, it's still great. But that being said, if, if we have to pivot and go in a different direction, then we do. I mean, mm. that's, that's what I do. It's, you know, that's the way you get through life. And it's great. I love it. Um, if, I, if I had to go flip burgers tomorrow in order to keep this dream alive, I would. Luckily, I don't. Mm. Um, but that's how we started putting on events again. You know, we, we, um, my wife, Kristen, and I um, started Adventure Fitness where um, we put on triathlons. Um, we've got a great marathon out in Syracuse, New York that I just love. Um, and then we also, you know, help produce the, the U S obstacle course racing championship. So we took, um, we used to do events, you know, 10 years ago and we, uh, we kind of put that in the back burner for a little while. And as a uh, mud run guide kind of matured and you know, I've got a team that's doing most of the work, we got to, uh, redevelop that passion and get back into putting on triathlons and, and mar marathons and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So now you're you're rolling. You're you've got the the critical mass. You've got the audience. You can now 
branch out and do other projects because you have the, the eyeballs and the attention of the people who are passionate about this sport, right? So you're, you're in a good position. You were there at a good time and you've grown with the sport. I think it's fantastic. Now, I'm curious, Brett, that there may, there will be listeners who are also, you know, staring at that path, which you've sort ah. of, you've blazed a trail and you're way down this path now. Uh-huh. And it's never been a straight line. We know that it's sort of <laughs> <laughs> well, meanders. But you're there. Yeah. You're further down the path, and they're looking at it, thinking, "Wow, yeah. you know, I'm doing this thing. This is my my pet project. I'm doing this sure. thing, maybe on the side. And you know, I I want to do what Brett has achieved thus far, right? I want to get to that stage. I want to go and paddle down the lake on a Monday, <laughs> right? that kind of thing, rather than go, you know, commute to the office. And you know, I want to go and pursue my dreams. I even think, for example, like one of the recent I. Inter- interviews that i recorded was with greg dylan who's just started or only a few months in uh a kayak triathlon or what's called a kayathlon website in uh ireland cool which is focused purely on kayathlon which is a growing yeah. sport you know kayak uh-huh. i think it's a yeah. kayak bike run yeah in ireland which is a very niche market as well so but somebody like that who started on the side who, who's only months into it it if you were to look at what you've done and what would be the one thing, the one piece of advice you'd impart to somebody like that? Say, look, do this one thing and that will help grow your business because there's, there's a hundred things you could do, but you yes. know, what would be the thing that you just keep pushing this button and that will keep the thing going? Um, That's a bit of a tough question. Pa- I know I put you on the spot. Pa- but- it's, it's passion. It's passion. If you don't have a passion, if you have a passion for something, you can, you know, you can chew through a wall to get to that thing that you want. If you want it bad enough, there's nothing that's going to stop you. Now, that being said, you also have to be intelligent about it. I mean, you can't just bash your head against the wall. You know, you've got to figure out a way to get around that wall or through that door. Um, and personally for me, it, it, it comes down to finding other people that are uh, maybe not as passionate as you, but you can, you can connect with them. You know, if you're doing an athletic en- en- endeavor, you know, if, if nobody in Ireland owned a kayak, you know, a, a kayathlon would be a very difficult thing to create. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to, um, you know, for me, finding the other uh, athletes or finding the other people that are interested in it um, is a great place to start because you can – your idea might be a good idea, but an idea in a vacuum is a really, really, really weak one. Even the, even the best idea in the world, if you don't have a committee of people to bounce it off of and uh, those the same people to give you some more ammunition and to give you the feedback that you need to craft your vision – you're just, you know, you're just a guy creating one thing, and that thing's going to probably be one-dimensional. Mm-hmm. But when you bring other people into the, you know, into the fray with you, and you can, if, if you can, if you can impassion them to take that journey with you, then you know, you've, then you know, you've got something. You know, mm-hmm. any one person can get excited by any one thing, but if you can, you know, get that small group around you and then grow from that core out to, you know, actual fans, that's when you really know that you have something. And, you know, I, I, I've gone both ways. You know, it's, with any business, you need customers. You know, with uh, athletic business, you need athletes who are your customers. But, um, you know, you need to do it from a point of passion. But one thing that I, that I have to say, and I would be remiss to not point this out, if you're starting a business and you've got this passion, keep the day job, grow the passion, you don't need to quit everything you're doing right away to jump into that. That's the biggest mistake that I see. People, I kept my day job, man. You know, I, I worked as long as I could and I banked as much as I could until I just couldn't stand showing up to an office anymore. But, but by that point, I had actually had income. Whereas I see some people, you know, who will be, you know, working a great job and they'll have steady income and they'll make the stupid mistake of going, hey, I really want to do this. I'm going to jump both feet into, you know, making these widgets and let go of their day job. The hard thing is it's going to take you a year to make a penny on those widgets unless you can afford to live for a year. Don't do it. You know, it's a, bootstrapping is is bootstrapping for a reason. You gotta you gotta pull yourself up. Uh, you know, <laughs> by yourself. So um, you know, my strongest recommendation is, hey, keep working, but but moonlight. You know, put in the hours. You know, do, do the research. You know, find the other people that are going to help you on that journey. But um, it's not an overnight thing, man. You know, you you've got to work pretty damn hard 
to create something. But the harder you work, the more important it is that you do it. You know, you're, you're, if, you, if you build something that you really love, it shouldn't come easy. You know, passion should never be easy. You know, just because you love something doesn't mean it's just going to roll over and fawn at you. You know, if you love something, you've got to work even harder to achieve it. And that's what work is all about. That's what being an entrepreneur is all about. You know, you, you take something that you love and you, you know, you, you put everything into it in order to get that little bit back. Mm. Oh, that, that's great advice, Brett. I like that point about, you know, having the passion, but at the same time, building that network of people around you or convincing people to come on board who maybe aren't mm. as, well, I guess, blindsided sometimes as to the, the, the strengths or weaknesses of a business. And I, mean, I think, you know, the whole entrepreneurial world is littered with stories which we don't hear about of people who followed their passions mm -hmm. but nothing ever came of it because nobody else shared that passion right and we, we yep. all talk about when you you hear people talk about startups they say yeah follow your passion but you only hear about the success stories right yeah, so survivor exactly. bias right exactly. these guys followed their passion and they were successful but what about these other ninety nine thousand that failed right so i'm exactly. curious that i mean it's really good advice it's like to you know your one of your first steps should be connecting with other people what with your business you had a partner was there anything else that you went and did beyond that you know connecting with other people in the scene the fans and so on i mean how did you go about that how did you go about you know, I guess pitching the idea of Mud Run Guide to people when you were talking and getting out there. What kind of things were you doing? What kind of activities? Well, the lucky the lucky part for for us was I had just made all those relationships. Um, so my book Ultimate Obstacle Race Training was just coming out, and I had just um, I had just met thirty different races. You know, part of part of what I did in the book was I outlined all these different types of races. So. Um, when I came, you know, my, my partner, Chris came into it with the technology. That's what he does for a living. He's, uh, he's, <laughs> he's a really, really bright dude, mm. but he came into it with, um, the ability to make anything happen. I came into it with the personal relationships and for me, they were all fresh. So luckily I was at a point where if I wanted to, you know, work with tough mudder or I wanted to learn more about Spartan race, I could, you know, I could, I could call up the, you know, the, the CEO of, of Spartan race, you know, Joe DeSena is a, you know, a friend of mine and somebody I consider a mentor. So I had, um, I had instant access to all of the, you know, the people that were moving and shaking and, and making this sport tick. And all of them were idiots just like me. I mean, they had no idea what they were really doing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think maybe some people will bristle at that, but it was the wild, wild west. You know, most people had no clue. And what they were doing in 2010, 11, 12 is way different than what we're doing now in 2017. But the great part was we all took this ride together. Now, yeah. I do recognize the fact that I was in the right place at the right time with the right people. Don't get me wrong. You know, starting a race right now or starting a website like ours right now would be difficult. But who knows? You know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe um, try it. What is it? Kayak? Kayak. Kayak. Kayathlon. Maybe kayathlon will take off. You know, the sport of swim run is is growing. You know, we're definitely getting some interest from people that are doing Otillo swim run. And um, now with obstacle course racing, the, the big thing is these enduros that are going on, um, you know, eight, eight, 12, 24 hour enduros. So, you know, you there there are cottage industries with every single sport it doesn't have to be sport but in my interest my interests you know really really tie back into athletic endeavors but every single sport whether it's triathlon whether it's triathlon whether it's ocr there's there's a niche there whether it's um whether it's gear whether it's information whether it's um connecting athletes whether it's a, you know it's just a group to get together you know all of these um in the in the states here um there's a lot of well there's a lot of triathlon groups as well but one of the things that's huge out here with obstacle course racing are these um local groups you know there's ones in colorado there's ones on the east coast there's there's ones all over the place and there's you know there's hundreds you know with the weeple uh, army out in california there's close to a thousand um um people that are members mm -hmm. and you know, they connect on a friendship level, you know, they support each other at races, you know, they, uh, they all travel together and that. So there's a huge power in having these groups, you know, whether you whether you're a part of it, whether you're a leader, but also looking at around the edges, are, are is there something in the sport that you love, that's underserved? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, is it a dating app for people that do this? Is it a, um, 
Uh, you know, is it um, better travel deals? Whatever it happens to be. You know, uh, a girl that um, that worked with us that I, I think the world of. She started a um, an adventure travel agency called Explorer Explorer Chick, and um, you know she she quit her. Yeah, you know, she worked on it for a little while, earned some money, and uh, and she you know quit her day job and she travels all over the world. And Nikki, um, her, what she does is is really inspiring. You know, mm-hmm. she she's a um, she's fearless. And she takes people all over the world to all these different adventures, and it's crazy because she's like a uh, she became a travel agent for adventure. You know oh. those all of those jobs exist, but you have to make it. <laughs> you have to pick yourself. <laughs> yep, that's what absolutely. It comes to. Well, that, I mean, totally. it's fantastic advice, and I, I mean, just in summary, also some of the, the things you mentioned as well. I think are, are great tips like writing books. I mean, you have a podcast as well. I'm sure we'll share the the link as well coming up at the end of the show. Sure. You know, like me with this podcast as well, it's a great way to connect with people like yourself, Brett. You know, and I think it's like what you have achieved in adventure racing, in obstacle racing is to, you know, you connected with like, for example, Spartan Race, Joe DeSena, Mm -hmm. these kind of people, you know, by writing this book. And I think anybody who's building a business also has to think about, you know, that investment in the network. And one of the great ways to do it beyond sort of going to the events and hanging out at events and shaking hands and all that kind of stuff is to write or get your name out there, right? Whether it's a YouTube channel or it's a podcast or publishing Mm -hmm. a book as well, because you want to be able to build those relationships before you can kind of get benefit from them right in your business and that's really helped with mud run guide and growing that as well because now you have the whole industry partnering up with you right so brett been a real inspiration talking to you today and we've done the whole hour so it's been fantastic thank you you know it went they went so fast it was so fast right (laughs) we flew by and we covered everything well we didn't even we scratched the surface of obstacle course racing but if people want to find out more listeners want to find out about you and mud run guide where do we go give us some links that we can go and oh check man out. everything that i do starts with and ends with mudrunguide.com um that's that that's the place to go we we cover you know not only mud runs on obstacle course races but we're huge with the uh the ninja warrior community um that's actually Trend wise, that's a huge growing, um, growing segment about everything that we do and the same type of thing. I mean, I was, I was lucky enough to be on American Ninja Warrior in, uh, season five and become friends with, uh, Mighty Casey and Brent and Evan and all these different ninjas. And the crazy part is now the, um, the crossover between the Ninja Warriors and obstacle course racers. You know, nowadays they're, they're the same people because the it's it's a blast, man. Um, this this sport is is really fun. Love the people. But once again, mudrunguide.com. Um, I'm Brett at mudrunguide.com. So at any point, if you have any questions about anything, you want to get into the sport, you want to learn more about it, just pop me an email. Fantastic, Brett. It's been a real inspiration having you on the show today and sharing your story. And I think people listening to this story will be inspired to you know go down that path of transformation as well take steps like you have done you know you were once the the kid who was picked last the the overweight smoker (laughs) but since then you've achieved so much more not just with brian's beachside boogie (laughs) there's so much more well graham you you and i both know the difference was i may have been picked last before but i decided to pick myself exactly well that's the best advice that we'll end this interview on today Brett Stewart, co-founder of Mud Run Guide. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Graham. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sport business. Find out more at www.endurancefm.com.